No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Sultan Arhan ibn Uthman he carried his fa- father's policy of expansion. He carried his father's advice and based upon the constitution, the ideological constitution that was set by his father, he now established the framework, the structural element now for the expansion and the proliferation and the development of the Ottoman Empire. His reign started in the year 726 after Hijra, which corresponds to 1327 CE. And he would liberate places like Nicomedia, which is current day Izmit, uh, which is uh, the northwest uh, portion of the Asia Minor. And uh, he sent his son to capture the Dardanelle Channel. His son, Soleiman, he occupied this channel, which essentially is in an area of, uh, in northwestern Turkey, and it divides the European and the Asian side. And his son actually showed a lot of bravery in this operation. He took about 40 warriors in the year 758 after Hijra. Suleiman, he crossed the channel at nighttime with 40 warriors and he seized many Byzantian ships. And they sailed these ships to the European shore where they liberated the ports of Tarnab, Gallipoli, the Jana fortress there, Uppsala, Rodestu. And these were all very strategic locations. But beyond the geographical expansion of this empire, the great thing that Orhan did was uh, build the institutions. So, for example, the first Uthmani University was established. Now, this first Uthmani University was established um, uh, under the principles that his father had left him with. And he appointed Dawud al Kaysari an uh, Uthmani scholar, an Ottoman scholar who had actually learned in Egypt to be the chancellor of this first uh, Uthmani university. Uh, He built uh, many educational institutions besides the university to educate the masses. Uh, He also developed uh, the military component of their empire. And they organized the military into infantry and cavalry. They made them into units of 10, units of 100, units of 1,000. And there was significant investment that was put into the military. One fifth of the uh, spoils of war or what they were able to get through their expansion was delegated uh, towards reinvestment within the army. They developed a special branch of the army, a special forces branch called the al Inkashari, also known as the Janissary Corps. And these were made up of mostly new Muslims. So people who, as they're expanding, they're coming into the fold of Islam. What they have done is they actually have developed a military academic program. So not only are they training their soldiers in the art of war, but they're giving them Islamic education and worldly education as well. Now, there has been uh, some point of contention in regards uh, to the exact nature of the Janissary Corps or the al Inkishari army. Uh, they have been stated from some Orientalist sources, and many Muslim sources have also adopted this as well, that they would take one-fifth of the boys uh, or the children of the areas that they would conquer as part of their uh, spoils of war under some pretense called Daf Sharia, a child tax. And this was actually promoted early on by Orientalists and people who had an enmity with the Ottoman Empire, such as Karl Brokelman, Gibbons, Jupe, and also Kumoville. Now, many of these Orientalists, uh, they wrote about this and they came up with it uh, without a lot of evidence, and many Muslims adopted this uh, opinion as well. But according to many Muslim and Islamic scholars, this was an army made up of new Muslims and those people who were orphaned from the battle. So then they would get get them into this military system, which is more than just a soldier. You're actually being educated through the system. Now, uh, when he first formed this special forces or this branch of the army, he asked asked, uh, Al-Hajj Baktash, 
to make dua, so the scholar to make dua for the army. And he asked uh, him, uh, Arhan, it's like, have you made uh, a name for this army? Have you decided what you're going to name it? And so the Sultan, he said, no, I haven't uh, figured out a name as of yet. So Al-Hajj said, so you should just call it Yani Tishri, the new army. And so the flag of the Ottoman Empire became a flag that had a red cloth and it had a centered crescent and beneath it was a sword named Dhul Fuqar. So if you remember, the sword of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was named Dhul Fuqar. So this idea of the flag and having the sword of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was given by his brother Alauddin. Ibn Uthman. So his brother was known to be a scholar of the deen. He was also known to be a Zahid, somebody who was very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshipping Allah and neglecting a lot of the temptations of the world. He took over a uh, part of Asia Minor that was previously, previously held by the Seljuk Empire. The uh, governor in Qurasib, uh, this is uh, in the time of 736 after Hijra, 1336 CE. Uh, he, uh, this was portions within the Byzantine Empire or border of the Byzantine Empire. So the Roman portion of the Seljuk Empire, they started to fracture. So this was a Muslim empire okay, that started to fracture. It had a lot of internal disputes and the sons started to fight over pieces of this empire. And Aruhan, he took advantage of the situation and he actually conquered uh, this land in, in, in Kurase. And uh, he, if we notice, there's a difference between the way that him and his brothers, so Aruhan and Alauddin, are engaging with one another and how this fracturing uh, Seljuk Empire is interacting with one another, the family members and the Muslims within it. So the Muslims within it are doing a lot of infighting. There's a lot of division that is being caused within them. Uh, they're fighting for peace, different pieces of, of land and territory. Whereas if you look at the Ottoman Empire, they have a very different idea uh, and very different paradigm about how they're going about conducting their empire and how they're going about dealing with themselves, like amongst themselves, not just with others, but the more important thing is how you deal amongst yourself internally. And so he actually, Arohan, he initially proposed to his brother Alauddin that they should share this emerging empire. There should be a sharing that he has half of it and he has half of this empire. But his brother refused. His brother refused to have ownership or to divide the empire in two. He said that uh, his father, he said, our father made you the sole successor of the empire and it should not be divided. And so the response of Arohan, he said, since my brother, you will not take the flocks and the herds that I offer you, then be the shepherd of my people and be my advisor, be my vizier. So he made his brother his advisor. SubhanAllah, look at the interaction between both of them. The, uh, this is not a struggle for power. This is not a struggle for power. This is working towards something that is greater than yourself. When you fight, a lot of the infighting that happens and which actually weakens communities is a struggle for power, for prestige, for land, for resources, whatever you want to call it. And all this does is serve to weaken the community as a whole. When you try to strengthen the individual, you weaken the community as a whole. But what we see in terms of the values and the ideology of this emerging Ottoman Empire is that they want to keep the empire together, one sole leader and unified upon that. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, they started to establish many schools and villages. Uh, all the cities would have universities. They would study different languages. They would study science and math and physics and architecture and astronomy with, of course, more importantly, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh and Aqidah. Now, this is an important uh, aspect of this emerging empire because they are not always at war. They're not always militarily expanding themselves. For 20 years, so there's a 20 year period where all Orhan doing, is doing is he's working on establishing 
the institutional and uh, infrastructure of the empire. So masajids, uh, these educational institutions, uh, the army and solidifying uh, the way that the army is structured, un uh, having make, making sure that the uh, army has a deep-seated ideological framework that keeps it united upon something. And of course, what is it united upon? It's united upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, there was a power struggle that erupted in Europe during his time within the Byzantine state. Uh, Emperor John uh, Kentakuzenos asked Sultan Arukhan for help against uh, an enemy. And so Arukhan, he deployed in the year 1358 CE uh, forces uh, to help reinforce this Byzantine emperor. So it was not uncommon for even within Muslims, like Muslim emirates and states, to have fights with one another and then call uh, the non-Muslims for help, or non-Muslims or the Christians, they have fights amongst each other, and they would call the Muslims for help oftentimes. So this dynamic, it did occur during their time. And so after Arakhan uh, deploys this force to reinforce him and to help him, shortly thereafter, an earthquake uh, strikes the cities of Trakia. Now the walls of Gallipoli, they fall, and most of the residents, they flee, and at that moment, it became very easy for the Ottoman troops actually to come and take over the city. And that's what they did. This uh, the, the Byzantine emperor tried to protect the city, but it was too late. Uh, Aruhan, he said that this was an act from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which opened the city uh, for his army to take over. And this became actually the starting point for many of the European expansion. From here, they were able to seize many of the land in the Balkans. And when actually John V took control of the Byzantine state, he reaffirmed Arukhan's control over the area. He allowed him that without dispute, I'm not going to dispute this, you're going to be able to you know, take over this, uh, keep possession of this area. And he used this as a base as well, not only for expansion, but to make dawah. So this was, again, as we, as we mentioned at the beginning uh, of uh, the previous podcast uh, of the, the uh, Ottoman series, that the uh, one of the basis and one of the main mission statements of the Ottoman Empire was Dawah. Now, there are several factors, I think, at this point we need to appreciate of how Aruhan, Sultan Aruhan, was able to achieve his goals. Firstly, uh, he had a sense of thabat in expanding the state. So he was very steadfast. Uh, he was unrelenting in the expansion of the state. He was able to unify the ranks of his people. So he, they were very unified. Amongst the army, they were unifi unified. Uh, amongst their projects, they were unified. Everything that formed the basis that permeated, whether it's their educational institutions, whether it's their military institutions, whether it's their political institutions, was Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And he truly embodied the sense of Jama'ah, keeping everybody together, keeping the congregation together upon this uh, very important framework of Aqidah. And because they were unified upon something like this that's so powerful, combined with the fact that there is division within the Byzantine state. The Byzantine state has internal conflict. The Byzantine state, um, there, there's this weakness because of this infighting between Bulgaria, Serbia, and Hungary. And then you also have a deep-seated ideological difference between uh, the uh, the Catholics, so like the the ones that are more on the western part of this, uh, you know, Christian empire, uh, and uh, the Orthodox Christians, so the ones that are more near Constantinople. Okay, so there's this division that is also uh, amongst them. They're unified uh, at times, but then there's this undercurrent that keeps dividing them uh, as well. And uh, as I mentioned, like this, the, that military system that they established was very key. They highly uh, emphasized education and their divine objectives. So what are their higher objectives in terms of like, the, what is the creedal belief? What is the ideological creedal belief? Are we doing this simply for material gain? Or is there some type of spiritual uh, component 
for uh, these initiatives and, and this project. Now, the next uh, one to take over uh, after him was Sultan Murad I. And so, uh, so previously, uh, the uh, his reign of uh, Orhan it was uh, about uh, 32, 33 years. That was, uh, you know, that was his reign. And then afterwards, of course, now you have uh, Sultan Murad I, and he also has approximately three decades uh, in terms of uh, his reign as well. And he was known uh, for his justice. Sultan Murad I was known for his justice. So much so that many European sources commented on the type of just personality that Sultan Murad I had. Uh, he was known for struggling for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in terms of also expanding uh, militarily his empire, he was known for that. He was known for building masajid. He was known for building many educational institutions and schools. And also he was known for building uh, homes for people who were homeless and, and, and buildings and giving support for those who did not have homes. Uh, he took the counsel of the best military leaders and experts and because of the combination of all this and the, com and the culmination of previously of the efforts of uh, Sultan Orhan, uh, he was able to conquer Adrianople current day Edirne in the year 762 after Hijra. And this was actually the second most strategic city in the Byzantine Empire. So after um, Constantinople, so current day Istanbul, after that Edirne was the most strategic city in the Byzantine Empire. And so what, of course, if it's so strategic, the Ottomans, they move their capital to that city. So initially, their capital was in Bursa. And so now from Bursa, it moves to Edirne, their capital. And later, of course, it would become Constantinople, which they would later name Istanbul, which we know today as Istanbul. Now, the objectives of moving from Bursa to Edirne was to develop a military presence in, uh, in that area because it was so strategic and so that they could build their military strength. They wanted, uh, their idea was to further expand into Europe and they wanted to, uh, of course, combine um, not only their military objectives, but also to be on that cutting edge of, uh, you know, uh, cultural um, and educational expansion. So they're giving dawah. They're also learning from their Europeans. They're learning from their own uh, history from the Islamic world. So it, it served as a real nice nexus point of this type of development uh, within their institutions and the advancement of their society. So it became, this was the capital for uh, approximately 90 plus years because uh, remember 1453 is when Constantinople became the capital for the Ottoman Empire. Now there uh, formed at this point a, crus a crusader alliance. Now many of the uh, Balkan nations, uh, many of the European nations with the blessing of Pope Urban V uh, so, for example, we're including Serbia, Serbians, Bulgarians, Hungarians, uh, regions of Romania. They uh, they decided to uh, attack the Ottomans, and so they attacked actually uh, one of the Ottoman leaders, Salal uh, Shaheen. Sixty thousand soldiers, this coalition of crusaders, attacked him. He was outnumbered, but uh, during this fierce battle. Uh, this was in the city of Cherming uh, on the river of, of Maritza. This fierce battle they were able to overcome and they were able to repel. And not only were they able to defeat the Crusader army, uh, two of the Serbian leaders that fled later drowned in the river of Maritza. The king of Hungary actually who was present in that to show you how important that battle was. He fled but he was able to survive. Now during this these battles and these skirmishes, they were able to liberate the provinces of Trakia, so in Bulgaria, Macedonia, up to West Bulgaria and Eastern Serbia. The cities uh, under uh, many of the Bulgarian and Serbian state uh, also fell in their hands. At this point, the first treaty between the Ottoman state and the Christians were created. So the Republic of Rajusa, the state, there's a state by the Adriatic Sea, 
with uh, Sultan. Uh, they they made this with Sultan Murad, and this treaty basically involved them paying 500 gold ducat to the uh, Ottomans. So this uh, basically entailed them uh, paying that, and obviously the Ottomans would not attack them. They made a peace treaty, and actually once uh, they they do that, then the Ottomans almost become like their protectors as well. Uh, the first battle uh, which helped start to liberate the lands in, in Kosovo uh, occurred in the year 1389 CE. And this was uh, a very hard fought uh, battle. Again, many times uh, they were outnumbered. And one thing that we can see is that they followed the same methodology of the Sahaba and the earlier generations when they're met with these overcoming challenges. And what do they do? How do they meet these challenges? What is the first thing that they turn to? They say, okay, we need to make more alliances. We need to invest more in technology and resources. Uh, we need to do, like, that's the first thing usually people think of, right? Like, um, this is how we are going to overcome the problem. Think about it, I'm sick. The first thing I need to do, I need, a, I need the medicine right away. Oh, um, I, I, I have uh, um, a, a great calamity. Okay, what's the material way? Can I buy myself out of this calamity? Can uh, I get uh, somebody to physically help me, uh, you know, through this calamity? Well, you know, this is usually uh, a way that people think. This is how people usually react. This is their reflex mechanism, so to speak. The re what, what, where do these uh, people from the Ottoman Empire turned to, where did the early Muslims firstly turn into before they used material means that Allah SWT has provided? They turned to the book of Allah SWT. So what you see here is that uh, he would have the Quran carried through the army and they would be reciting ayat from Surah Al-Anfal where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells O Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, urge the believers to fight. If there are 20 steadfast persons amongst you, they will overcome 200. And if there be 100 steadfast persons amongst you, they will overcome 1,000. SubhanAllah. That type of encouragement from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, why is it so impactful to them? Why after hearing ayat like this, are they able to achieve great feats? How come they're able to do that? How come the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, uh, b Battle of Badr being overwhelmed with uh, the numbers they're facing are able to overcome? How is it, you know, time after time, they're uh, able to overcome these great odds? Uh, Battle of Khanda, you know, it's they, when they face, you know, these, these great, uh, you know, amounts of uh, obstacles in front of them, the great armies that would be uh, facing them is because when they would turn to the ayat of Quran, they truly believed and they truly felt that this was kalam Allah. This was the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is wahi. This was revelation sent by the creator of everything, sent by the creator down to his uh, most uh, beloved servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was given then uh, as a hidayah, you know, as a source of guidance for all of humanity. So they truly believe that if this is coming to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are 20, you can overcome 200. If you are 100, you can overcome 1000. The challenge, the odds, the, those are numbers. But of course, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you, you can overcome, you can overcome whatever you are facing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only created you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the problem you're facing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the solution for you to be able to emerge from that problem as well. And so giving this glad tidings to the believers, this you know, made the morale of the Muslims, uh, you know, it's raised their morale. It may put it in a positive direction. Now everything is connected. Remember, everything goes hand in hand. You can't go to somebody and tell them ayat of Quran and they have never connected with the Quran and it's going to hit them in uh, a very deep way or they don't, or there's a lot of doubts in terms of their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So if they have a lot of doubts in terms of their belief in, in Allah and in the Qur'an and they don't usually turn to the Qur'an and it's not special to them and they're not educated about the Qur'an and the Hadith, it would have much less of an impact on them. You know, it has it has uh, much less impact. So for example, today, a lot of the people that are truly impacted by a lot of the uh, racism that occurs right now in the world today, say specifically, let's take the uh, recent issues that are happening in the United States with the protests, uh, the activism that's occurring. People who are educated with the history of slavery, the history of genocide that has occurred uh, in Africa, where that genocide far greatly eclipses, for example, the Holocaust, but it doesn't get the same amount of attention, right? So, but the people who are educated, they are deeply hurt. They are deeply hurt when they know the history and they uh, have the knowledge of the fact that, you know, there has been so much pain and trauma and look at how it has continued for hundreds of years. You're impacted more when you are more educated about the issue, correct? This is just general. This is general logic. We can uh, ascertain that. Same, similarly, uh, people know about the uh, the tragedy that occurred during the Holocaust. People will, uh, w when they're educated on that, it'll it'll affect them more, especially if they have family members that have been affected from that. If you're in Kashmir and you know the history of Kashmir and you know about uh, you know the past year what they've gone through, of course. Uh, it's going to affect you more because you're educated. Uh, the average person who has no idea where Kashmir is, if you tell them, oh, they've put them uh, under lockdown for a year, it won't affect them that much. You know, the, the people are in Palestine. If you know uh, how the Palestinians have been treated in being an open air prison for so long, then of course it's going to impact you more. So whatever you're educated about, whatever you know, you are more impacted by that. You are more impacted. That's why knowledge forms the basis of our iman. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us in the Quran, "Fa'lam annu la ilaha illallah." The first thing is to know who Allah is. Then the action, then then the command for action is given. Wastaqfirulillahumbik, and then go ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for forgiveness. So knowledge is the most key and important thing uh, in terms of you building your iman. So when you look at the the uh, the strategic. Uh, the the planning of the Ottoman Empire and how they built their institutions and how they emphasize education even amongst the army. This is not a army made out of, uh, of barbarians. This is an educated army. So now when you are reciting ayat of Quran to this army that is educated in aqidah, that is educated in hadith, that is educated in Quran, it affects them more. So this is also a key tip for us to be uh, imp more impacted by our deen than perhaps uh, we already are. Now, after the victory in Kosovo, uh, Sultan Murad went to go inspect the uh, battlefield, the army, look at the fallen soldiers, the injured soldiers, and he was walking by the rows of dead Muslims and he was making dua for them. And he, uh, as he was checking, on them, a Serbian soldier who was pretending to be dead rushed towards Sultan Murad. But the his guards were able to subdue him and stop him. But he said, listen, I just want to go and give my shahada to the Sultan. So I want to declare my shahada, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, to uh, the Sultan. So Sultan Murad, he agreed to let him come close to him. And so he signaled to the guards to release him. And so this man pretended to uh, kissed the hand of the Sultan and then he saw, suddenly pulled out a poisonous knife and he stabbed the Sultan uh, which would lead to his death and this was in Sha'ban uh, 791 after Hijra the 15th of Sha'ban. Now what were the last words? So he was, he, Sultan Murad was 65 years old when he uh, was killed and what was his last words? And subhanAllah very close, similar age to uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he died, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, who died you know, 63 years old. So he's dying, he, he, he died at the age of 65, uh, Sultan Murad. He says, in my departure, I can only but thank Allah, the knower of the unseen, the acceptor of the dua of the poor. I testify that there is no God but Allah. None deserves to be thanked or praised but him. 
My life nears its end, and I have seen the victory of the warriors of Islam. Obey my son Yazid. Do not torture the prisoners. Do not harm them, and do not rob them. I bid you farewell to our great victorious army, leaving you all to the mercy of Allah, for he is the one who safeguards our state from any harm. Now, do you notice a pattern that he speaks in? And this is a pattern that you see with people who have a close connection with the deen of Allah, how, how they speak. Firstly, he starts always, he starts and ends by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He starts by focusing on Tawheed. Their purpose, before he even talks about all these different issues in regards to uh, human rights, about the expansion of the empire, the ambition of the empire, before he talks about anything to do with many of the affairs of the state. That's the first thing. What we are missing today oftentimes is we focus on the affairs and the policies, but there's no deep core values that we acknowledge that it's stemming from. Like what is like, do what do we uh, submit ourselves to? What do we ultimately submit ourselves to? What should we ultimately be humbled by? What should we always remember at the beginning, at the end? Just like when we eat, we say Bismillah, and at the end we sing Alhamdulillah. What is the this matter in between, this dunya, everything that we do in, in between, it started with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for us it will end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Allah will bring it to an end. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forever, He's continuous. Now, he had this firm faith, of course, Sultan Murad, the, uh, the first he had the, this firm faith. Uh, he he had this sweetness of Iman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hujurat, only those are the believers who have believed in Allah and His Messenger and afterward doubt not, but strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah. Those they are the truthful. SubhanAllah. Only those are the believers, very clear, very plain, very clear language, بلاغ المبين, a very clear message. Only those are the believers who have believed in Allah and His Messenger. And afterwards, doubt not, doubt not in Allah and His Messenger, but strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah, those they are the truthful. Now when we say having no doubt, many uh, haters, many people who have enmity to Islam or sometimes religion in general, they say that's fanatical to have no doubt. But we understand something, when you have a truth, when you recognize a truth, you shouldn't doubt after you've recognized it to be truth. Now, your adherence to that truth can fluctuate. And we understand that as Muslims. So for us, being a true mu'min, being a better believer is to have no doubt. Believe Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have no doubt. Don't waver in that truth, in that belief. Because if you waver in that, then you are going to go into a state of instability and anxiety. You understand what I'm saying? How, let me illustrate this to you. If I say to myself, this cup is in front of me and it's filled with water and I'm drinking this water. It's something that I feel, yeah. It's truth, but if, if someone were to say you believe that there's a cup of water without any doubt and you're going to drink from that and you believe without a doubt you're, that that's water in there that, you're, that you've just drunk, you're a fanatic. You're right. You're right. I need to show I'm critical thinking and I need to be balanced. Maybe this isn't in a cup. Maybe this isn't water. Maybe this is air. Maybe I'm so thirsty right now, but maybe this isn't something that's going to nourish me. You know what? Am I really even holding this and you – and then you just drop it and it shatters everywhere. That didn't really shatter. I'm just going to step on it and your toe starts bleeding. Well, it's not really bleeding. It's not really getting infected. 
that that does not make sense. Once you've established something to be true, to say that, okay, you're a fanatic because you believe that to be true is illogical. It doesn't make sense. We do that all the time. Once we establish something, once we say one plus one equals two, do we say that, okay, you all believe, you believed all your life that one plus one equals two? You're a fanatic. No, that's, you know, our adherence, we know that Iman can fluctuate, go up and down. We know that Iman is, has the ability to uh, increase and decrease. So Iman itself, like we know that there are times, and we shouldn't conflate that, my dear brothers and sisters, with doubt. Your Iman can go up and down. But when you recognize, it's like, for example, it's true, right? Like we can establish it as a, as, as a truth that if I were to sit down and just eat a tub of ice cream that that's bad for me like people people will anyone who who is educated in in, in, in diet in, in in basic uh you know biological functions of a human being and have explained to them that oh, yeah you're right it's 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 not good for you especially if you do it every day you know so what about smoking is there any nutritional uh effect or help uh, smoking no what about doing drugs no, there's no there. There's not a, a benefit. Some people, of course, some certain drugs, they'll say there is a a, a benefit, but definitely without a doubt, um, you know, long term use of uh, these uh, psychoactive drugs have an effect, okay, on your neurotransmitters and your connections and so forth. So there's there's no doubt, but so there's no doubt in that science that people that have, okay, that okay, this is oh, this is supposed to be true for my health. But do people adhere to this even though they know it to be true? Do people always adhere to the truth? No, they don't. Right? No, people don't do that. People do things that they know to be untrue all the time. So yes, there's a difference between that. And we know that Iman can fluctuate. And we know that your practice of the deen can fluctuate up and down. But for us to say that we are accepting and we're a pluralist, pluralistic community and we're a tolerant community because we have doubts in our belief in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is something that is unacceptable from a deen perspective and from a logical perspective, from a rational perspective. You don't operate on that in life. You don't drive down the street and say, is it really true that I'm driving on the street right now? Is it really true that this vehicle is made of, uh, you know, solid metal parts and plastic and rubber and that uh, it can harm uh, uh, another human being? Like, you don't question these things, okay? You establish certain things to be the truth and then you don't doubt in it. For us as Muslims, this is a key fundamental component for us to reach Iman, to a higher level of a man, to be a true mu'min. Only those are the believers who have believed in Allah and his messenger and after doubt not. They don't doubt in Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you make mistakes? Yes. Did Sahaba make mistakes? Yes. Yes, you can make mistakes because your practice of that can go up and down. What does Allah SWT say? But uh, uh, doubt not, but strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah, they are the truthful. They are the truthful. So uh, we see in the life of Sultan Murad that he prioritized deen, he prioritized iman, he pri prioritized uh, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa tells us on a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, whoever possesses the following three qualities will have the sweetness of faith. The one to whom Allah and His Messenger وسلم, become dearer to him than anything else. And number two, who when he loves a person, he loves him only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, who he who hates to revert to disbelief as he hates to be thrown into the fire. All of these things have to do with your emotion. So now what we see here is that the complete dynamic nature of Iman. That Iman, the foundation of Iman is based on knowledge. But you cannot separate the emotional com component from it. So the true sweetness of Iman isn't just relegated to knowing this is right and wrong and just uh, 
approaching your your practice of Islam is like without passion. It doesn't involve emotion. It doesn't in, involve uh, feelings that you uh, that you that Allah and His Messenger is so dear, so close to Him. He loves Allah and His Messenger sallallahu After that, what? Loving people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for what they can do for you materially, but not what you can exploit from them, from that relationship, not from the networking, not from the social component of that friendship, not because that person makes you laugh, not because you can get something from that person, you love that person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means also that that person is, you know, they have, they, they, they remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they remind you of your deen. And they hate, so they look at this. They're loving and they're hating for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa they hate to re re revert to disbelief, as they would hate to be thrown into the fire. His uh, rulership lasted, as I mentioned, for three decades, and it was uh, combined with dawa, with uh, uh, with a true iman, and uh, he was well regarded by many of the European historians. The Byzantine historian Halko Nadalus, he said regarding Sultan Murad I, Sultan Murad undertook many significant activities. He engaged in 37 battles in both Anatolia and the Balkans and was victorious in all of them. He treated all his subjects well, regardless of their religion or race. The French historian Trinad, he says, Murad was one of the greatest leaders from the Uthman family, from the family of Uthman. If we evaluate him personally, we find him to be of a higher status than all of the European leaders of his time. So Sultan Murad the first, he's almost regarded like Salah ad-Din Ayyubi. Salah ad-Din Ayyubi, who took back Jerusalem, who took many of the lands out, back away from the Crusaders, was so well regarded by many of even the European historians of the way he used to treat people, his own people, Muslims and non-Muslims. That's the hallmark. That's that's a personality that even your enemies can help but be in awe of you. Even your enemies, see, that's a, that's a special person. That's a special type of individual. It's not only are you able to fulfill your cause, not only are you able to advance your cause, but you are able to get that respect and that admiration from your opponents, from your enemies. I remember watching a uh, documentary on Muhammad Ali and oh, they would just bring like one opponent after another that Muhammad Ali had defeated in this documentary. And all of them spoke so highly of Muhammad Ali. Like he had won them over. He made his his opponents, that people that he had, uh, you know, uh, during the fight promo had uh, ridiculed and they were fighting, like fist fighting, like uh, boxing in the ring. And there was, the uh, in many of these fights, the emotions were so high. But all of these people after the fact had such a great admiration for Muhammad Ali. If you look at the, the, the our greatest Muhammad, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even his enemies, even his enemies could not help but respect him, could not help but admire him, could not help but trust him with their valuables. Even after, can you think about, can you, can you believe this, that they had still, even though they're trying to, to kill him, to harm him, they're completely opposed to him uh, ideologically, they still, they trust him, they can't help but admire him, they can't help but get scared when he gives a prophecy, when he talks, when he makes a dua that uh, the Muslims will defeat them and that he promises victory, they get scared. When he says ayat of Quran, they get scared because they know this is a truthful person. I disagree with you, I oppose you, but I can't help but accept the fact that there is greatness with you. You have greatness within you. And this is uh, something that we see in the character and the personality of Sultan Murad the first. Inshallah, we will continue on the series of the Ottoman Empire with a Sultan that was given the nickname Lightning. So next week, who was the Sultan that was given the nickname Lightning and why was he given the nickname 
Lightning. We'll see you all next week. Remember, we want to live by the huck, die by the huck. And just when you think life is stuck, tune in to Life Huck. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Watch Rise of the Ottomans only on the Life Huck podcast, guaranteed to leave you changed through inspiration, information, and iman elevation. For more clips and installments in the series, go to youtube.com slash Dr. Sayed. And for more notifications and iman boosting content, follow us on Twitter at life underscore huck. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah. 